Hello, welcome to this uh, session on a new dynamic uh, relations between the US uh, and China. My name is Simon Cox. I'm Emerging Markets Editor for The Economist uh, based in Hong Kong. And I've been uh, keeping an eye on the dynamics between China and the US for uh, over 10 years now. Um, it's very interesting. We saw uh, just a month ago uh, Xi Jinping outlining new targets, new goals for China's economy, uh, the hope that it would double in size uh, by 2035. Um, I looked up whether other economies that had reached a similar level of development to China had managed that feat. And it's quite hard to find any examples. Uh, Japan actually didn't quite manage to double once it had reached China's level of development. Uh, South Korea did manage it, but in between it suffered a calamitous financial crisis uh, in 1998. So these goals that suggest great stability also include the possibility of huge tumult. And of course, we're finishing a tumultuous year, uh, the pandemic, the US election, uh, all the news we've seen in recent weeks about new financial regulations in China, uh, the postponed IPO of Ant. There's a great deal uh, to discuss. Uh, and so I'm joined by uh, a fantastic panel. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Let me briefly uh, introduce them all to you. Um, I'm joined by uh, Jai Chen Shi, who is Vice President of Tianfang Securities, uh, by Eric Robertson, Head of Global Research at Standard Chartered, Patrick Springer, who is Managing Director at Hua Tai Securities, but based in New York, uh, and also um, Kevin Rideout, who is Managing Director of Hong Kong Exchange, HKEX, uh, here where I live. Um, welcome to all of you. Um, Eric, perhaps if I could um, start with you. Do you think this goal of doubling China's economy by 2035 uh, is feasible? Well, Simon, as you say, the, the I guess the, the odds historically are perhaps not uh, in China's favor, but I, I think what we've learned uh, over the last 10 years is that through a number of crises as well as economic booms, uh, China has been able to manage the trajectory of its domestic economy extremely well. Uh, a number of years ago, they set a goal for uh, shifting the composition of growth uh, away from manufacturing and exports towards the services sector, towards domestic consumption, and lo and behold, they've managed to achieve that pretty well. Uh, if you go back to the global financial crisis, we had obviously China uh, initiating a massive uh, credit and, and monetary impulse to, to rescue their domestic economy. But as we all know, there was a significant amount of leverage left in the system. This time around, uh, with the current crisis, uh, they've managed to achieve a, a very wholesome recovery without nearly as much leverage deployed into the system. So the idea that China has very good control of its economic trajectory, I think, is still uh, largely pointing in the right direction. Uh, some of that control, though, relies on a financial system that's largely domestic. Uh, and of course, one of the reforms we've seen recently in China is a move towards financial coupling. It was the subject of the fireside chat that just finished. Uh, do you think, therefore, that China um, perhaps faces a more difficult trade-off between uh, stability and growth over the next 15 years? Well, look, I, I think if, if you go back about five years, uh, in, in our opinion, that was when they really started to prioritize uh, the quality of growth uh, and stability rather than just the absolute level of growth. And that was when we first saw evidence of the deleveraging campaign. Uh, we saw the first washout uh, in the onshore fixed income market. Uh, but I think what we have seen evidence of, especially over the last year or two, is that uh, they haven't sacrificed that much on the growth side, even though they've made significant forward strides in terms of, again, the quality of growth, the deleveraging, uh, and getting some of the issues like shadow banking under control. So, you know, I think there are obviously risks in terms of leverage, there are obviously risks in terms of uh, how they manage uh, both the domestic and international exposure. But I, I still think the odds are very much in favor uh, of a net positive trajectory. Uh, Jai Chen Chi, perhaps if I could ask the same question to you, do you think this goal of doubling China's economy by 2035 uh, is feasible? 
Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, according to my view, I think it's uh, quite feasible. Uh, as you have mentioned, the, uh, um, as to the Chinese government, they face some um, contradiction between the quality and uh, the growth. So I would like to share some views about this. The first one is that, uh, as you all know, during the past maybe three to four years, the um, how to say, the relationship between the uh, different countries like China and the US is a little tension. So Chinese government started to beginning to start to um, switch the focus to the domestic demand. So we call it dual circulation policy. So from this year, the government paid a lot of attention to um, stimulate the local demand of the China. So that's the first point. The second point is that the Chinese government pay more attention to the technology, to the innovation. So from the uh, last two years, the uh, government, the local government, uh, put more emphasis on the uh, on market reopening. We welcome more investors to go into China and give more license to the investors from outside, and also get some uh, very high, uh, very high level reform of the uh, local um, capital market. We have some um, innovation in the market market uh, mechanism, etc. And uh, the third one I would like to share is that. The huge demand of the local uh, inhabitants. You know, the Chinese gar the population is so huge, but the um, investment assets of the local uh, the uh, inhabitants, lots of them usually focus on the property assets. But now the local inhabitants beginning to switch their investment from property to some financial um, investment vehicles. So um, together we think. Uh, during the dual circulation strategy, Chinese government does have some possibility to um, attain a relatively lower but more stable um, economic growth in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, could I ask a follow-up question about the dual circulation strategy? Uh, I think everyone would welcome the domestic demand part of that, but the domestic supply part of it has raised more eyebrows. I mean, it sounds like a step away from opening up uh, towards a more self-contained economy. Rationale for that? Uh, okay, I will try to um, analyze the more more clearly about the dual circulation. So, firstly, I would like to say the Chinese government um, in in the announcement of the four things. Uh, five-year plan in the, in the last year. Uh, so the dual circulation strategy, including uh, different kinds of the how to say the views. The first one I'd like to say, uh, the Chinese government decided to open their market, open their um, more license to outsiders. So uh, from the last two years, uh, more of the um, the regulation, the local regulation, uh, has lifted the restriction of the license of the local, like the security company or uh, insurance company, etc. That's the first one. The second one is about the, the local government try to stimulate the local consumption, uh, like uh, uh, to buy more vehicles or more financial investments. So the local government is trying to um, give the local um, inhabitants more products to buy. And at the same time, because of the, um, how to say, the pandemic has um, stopped some of the uh, the communication between different countries. So China is one of the first one to uh, recover from the um, epidemic. So during the past year, uh, more of the mecha uh, mechanism of uh, manufacturing requirement shifted from outside to inside to local China. So that would also to help to stimulate our local formulation, uh, our local consumption. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, could I bring uh, you in here? Um, what do you think are the, the big challenges facing China over the next 15 years in trying to achieve this goal? Uh, I mean, in particular, the demographics don't look great, do they? Yeah, I think China has a couple of key challenges, and I think what's important about that is it's it's an opportunity for investors. 
Uh, the demographics are daunting. They have hundreds of millions of people that will be approaching retirement age. And China did not get mature enough to develop a fully financial infrastructure to allow the safety net that they need to create for their citizens. So despite the trade, despite all the trade troubles and the different uh, difficulties and negotiations with the United States, financial liberalization is pace in China, but China does need to open its markets and allow them to raise more capital. And these are a couple of critical things that are occurring with, with regards to that. And this question of bringing in more capital, I mean, we think of China as being a very high savings rate economy, mm -hmm. uh, one that runs a current account surplus, a net uh, exporter of capital to the rest of the world. Why does it need foreign money? Well, if you look at their current account deficit, uh, it, it, current account surplus, it has been in a large surplus for many, many years, but it's approaching zero. And as the, com as the country moves to a more consumption oriented society, it is, it is going to move to a deficit. So when we look at that, uh, that is a classic example of when they start to need, need to raise more funds. If you also look at the balance sheet structure of China, the second largest economy in the world and on a purchasing power parity basis, it's the largest in the world. They are actually structured like a small EM country, more like Greece and Turkey in terms of their balance sheet. They have over-reliance on bank loans. They have an under-reliance on equities and an under-reliance on fixed income. So from our perspective at Watai, we believe that over the next 10 to 15 years, institutionalization, internationalization, equitization, securitization, these are big changes that need to occur. And this is why we think that this year, the liberalization of QFI is so important to investors and it's so important to China. China is allowing new types of investors to get a QFI license. And this QFI license will allow them to access capital raising opportunities and they will, uh, and also uh, new, new access to hedging. In particular, our company is the, has the largest private stock pool of stock lending that is becoming available to QFI, uh, QFI investors. China has given licenses to companies that aren't so helpful in terms of being able to raise capital. In this new generation of QFI, there will be more investment funds, there will be more hedge funds, there will be more long only institutions that will help China raise capital. Um, Kevin, let me bring you in here. Um, Patrick, you described this underdeveloped uh, financial system in mainland China. Um, how does Hong Kong fit into that and, and is its role changing? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the development is encouraging. I, I think um, from a number of angles, I think um, the the first point is, is really when you talk about the um, the institutionalization of that market. I think um, for many years, we, we've talked about it being sort of 80% retail and that's got certain behaviors and it gets us into trouble on occasion. And so I think with the overhang of that aging population, very, very clearly we, need, uh, we needed that pension reform and, it's, um, and, and I, I think it's going um, in, in the right direction. I think if I look at things like the, the assets under custody of the, um, of the NSSF, for example, and, and many other funds growing in China, um, it's, starting, it's starting to sort of, on the journey of evening out um, to, to what we sort of normally call a stable market. Um, I think for, for, for Hong Kong, we, we, we still serve um, uh, very positively with the Stock Connect scheme in particular. Um, I think this year we've had uh, record inflows, and I think today itself is a record day. Um, so we'll continue to bring Western capital through the northbound channel into China. Um, within a blink of an eye, I think this year we've gone um, significant increase. Uh, last I looked uh, about a few weeks ago, already over the two trillion RMB mark being held through Stock Connect into into China. And so, for Hong Kong to, I, I never like to think of it as um, as competing with Kifi. I think we're after the same goal here, which is to to bring that uh, institutional capital into China and normalize the markets. Um, that then make it more palatable to to the pension schemes, um, but uh, we we will um, of course need to continue to evolve connect schemes. 
Um, I always say that uh, the job of, uh, of Stock Connect is really to make it like trading any other market, um, just a very short settlement window. So we, we do do things like uh, delivery versus payment. So if you, you sell your stock, you know you're going to get your cash, that type of thing. Um, think of things around best execution, um, et cetera. Um, so on the other side of it, it's, um, it's also important to understand that there will be Chinese companies who want to raise offshore capital. Um, so we continue to be that uh, leading destination for for the uh, for Chinese companies to do that, um, and uh, you know, and the IPO market um, is uh, is as robust as uh, I'm sure everyone on this call can see. My apologies. Um, do you, do you think that Hong Kong's uh, distinctive role um, is though changing, um, both because of uh, the difficulties it's faced over the last 18 months and also uh, the progress that uh, mainland uh, markets are making? Yeah, look, I think um, yeah, if, you, if you just continue, to, like any business, if you continue to stand still, then uh, uh, by the time you've realized it, it's, um, it's missed you. So um, continually need to evolve in Hong Kong to uh, to support the goals of what China is trying to achieve. Um, I still maintain that um, the role here is primarily to help China to become a more institutionalized market. Um, we'll do our bit to continue to bring the, um, the Western funds up through the northbound into China and uh, complement everything that uh, the QF is doing. Um, down the path, um, you know, we'll, we'll need to look at things like how do we partner together to uh, increase the inclusion levels in uh, in major indexes like MSCI, for example, which is really at the moment only 20% of its China potential. Um, that might mean things like uh, offering uh, offshore hedging tools um, and uh, and alike from, from those sort of angles. So um, it is naturally evolving and it will continue to evolve. And... Um, and we really want to be part of that. And I think um, we often think about um, the domestic building of the, of the Chinese capital market, and I think that's critically important. But don't forget as well, um, there's such huge asset bases there that's going to want to go um, from the east to the west, if you will. And so um, part of that evolution is making sure that Hong Kong exchange is, is totally uh, globally connected um, you'll have realized we, we announced the, uh, the suite of indexes for emerging markets in, in Asia, and it's uh, hopefully not too far in the distance future that uh, we've created a mousetrap that the Chinese would like to take exposure against. So uh, if they want that emerging market uh, exposure or through to Japan or to Australia, um, they've got it in their, uh, in their home here in Hong Kong. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this east to west uh, financial flow or capital flow. Um, you just look at the configuration of global interest rates. You look at the configuration of global growth. Why would anyone in China want to invest in the rest of the world right now? Um, uh, Jia Chen Shi, why don't you take that question? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm here. Yeah. Um, I'm very uh, positive. Can you hear me? Is it? It's okay. Yeah. We can hear. Um, you. I'm very yeah. I'm very positive about the outlook for the China and the West uh, for the future. So I'd like to share for um, several uh, three key supporting factors. I think the first one is about the the China's economic strategy. I've mentioned before. Uh, in this year, the, the government launched the uh, 14th five-year plan. So, and I mentioned the uh, dual circulation strategy. So given the increased the trade protectionism, luxury, the world economy, but China needs to rely more on domestic demand to drive its economic growth in the future. So, you know, the consumption accounts for only about 38% of GDP in China, but 68% uh, of GDP in US respectively. So the Chinese domestic demands have a huge potential to dig up. That's the first thing I'd like to share. The second one is about that, that you know, um, we think the pandemic will stop in the near future, I think. So we will welcome the pandemic recovery in the near future. And uh, um, 
The third one I'd like to share is about the future of the uh, market reopening. So, you know, uh, uh, in China, the, um, how do you say, uh, as the, the friend from the Hong Kong Exchange have, have mentioned, the bond connect and the equity market to reopen. So I have some data to share with you. Um, at the end of the October, the number of foreign investors uh, in the bond market had reached over 2,000, and an increase of 75 new investors in October alone. And as to the equity market, so in this year, the cumulative market uh, capitalization of onshore Chinese stocks from outside investors uh, amounts to over 2 trillion RMB. So uh, no matter bond market or equity market, both of them have a very increase of the investor from outside. So that means in the, um, uh, among all of the developed economies, as the interest rate is very low, but compared with the other countries, the Chinese local government, the bond is relatively high. The 10 year bond between the China and the US the amounts to the historical high of above 200 BEPs. So in this year, many of the foreign investors goes into China. And uh, also, as you have mentioned, the PBOC of, of China and Fed and etc. lots of the uh, central bank have injected lots of liquidity in the market. But the Chinese People's Bank of China stopped the injection of the liquidity, or would like to say, back to the normal policy, the monetary policy from May. So that means in the near future, the, uh, the RMB will appreciate in the near future. So that will make the local assets of China, RMB assets, more attractive to the Western investors, I think. Thank you. Uh, is there a danger that the RMB will strengthen too much? Ah, that's a good question. How do you say? Um, as to our local Chinese investor, I would like to say um, the Chinese government uh, also wait and see. So uh, we, I would like to um, analyze a little more about why RMB appreciate in within this year. Okay, I think there's two um, major the driving factor. The one is the fundamental economy, because between um, before. Uh, before yesterday, so China is only one of the economy that stopped the epidemic. So in China, um, most of the economy back to normal uh, during the past three quarters. So, you know, in the third quarter, the GDP growth rate jumps to the nearly 5% from the first quarter. That is negative 6.8%. So the economy of China is the highest one among the world. That's one reason, right? The second one is that it's about the um, monetary policy. The Chinese People's Bank of China is the one of the more, uh, how to say, um, more conservative bank of, uh, people's bank, uh, the, the central bank. So the central bank of China began to back to normal policy from May. That means the Chinese government has come into a normal monetary policy for about half a year. So that means um, the China has, um, how to say, um, does have some the appreciation pressure to the economy. But the government maybe don't need to, don't want to see such high, such a rapid depression, uh, appreciation um, trend. So the, PB, the PBOC also will um, do something to help to make it become more normal. So, um, and at the same time, uh, when the other country back to normal, step by step, I think the appreciation, the appreciation trend and the, 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 uh, the will slow down, I think. Though the trend is there, but it will slow down after the uh, other country back to normal economy. Okay. Thank you. Um, we've had a question from the audience about um, outbound investment. Um, there's still you know, substantial controls on capital outflows. Uh, when do you think China might liberalize those? Uh, Patrick, do you want to have a go at that question? Sure. You know, we, we literally think that there is going to be movement by the Chinese government to allow uh, QDII allocations to increase. 
Uh, we believe that as the currency looks stronger, um, you know, there's there's certainly some concerns. I, I hesitate to say that China has a line in the sand type currency level like Japan typically does that drives investors positive or negative views about the economy. I think investors have to continue to evolve their understanding of China because it's a 500 million population middle class alone that that is very interesting. Uh, so um, and and but from what we see here is that even if the currency appreciates, the, the consumer in China will have more choices is about uh, buying things overseas, and, and that will have some positive effects for, for, for trade concerns uh, around the world. But we see from an institutional perspective that QDI, the Chinese government is likely to make some moves uh, in 2021 with regards to allowing far, uh, domestic institutions to, uh, to uh, uh, invest overseas more. Uh, secondly, there is a very large and latent opportunity by Chinese retail who are incredibly interested in overseas securities. My company is the largest retail brokerage firm in China, and we are the largest online trading app uh, company with the largest online trading app on the mainland in China. Uh, we know that there is a significant amount of uh, investors that are particularly interested in, in the U.S. equity securities market. U.S. companies are incredibly uh, profitable and incredibly innovative, and uh, the Chinese consumer demand uh, for their financial wallet is to have that increase. And uh, that's that's a business opportunity that we see and that we're very optimistic about. Eric, could I ask you about this question too? I mean, given everything that uh, Jia Jinxi mentioned, you know, the trend appreciation of the RMB, um, we've had some very good, uh, obviously, returns in uh, mainland markets uh, this year. Um, and also just the fact that uh, PBOC policy is just much stricter than anywhere else in the world, um, higher interest rates on offer. Um, if China did open up completely its capital account, did allow, allow outflows, would there be any? Oh, I, I, I certainly think there would be. Um, and, and I think we have to imagine a world that's not too far away where not only we see uh, portfolio outflows, but the tourism outflows uh, recover as well. I mean, we talked earlier uh, about the current account surplus in, in China. Um, there was an expectation that we would go into deficit uh, before COVID hit, but obviously uh, the significant narrowing in the services deficit has been uh, what has allowed the current account to remain in surplus. But if we go back to a normal uh, or more, more normal world, we'll see outbound tourism from China. And I think that may coincide over the next year with more outflows from a, an institutional investor point of view. You know, you asked the question earlier, in a world where 10-year CGBs are at three and a quarter and 10-year treasuries are at 80 basis points, why would anybody move their capital offshore? Well, I think diversification of portfolios is, is, is a, a major driver of that. And, and we heard a moment ago about um, the interest in US securities, there will be interest in credit markets, both in, in US and in Europe uh, and emerging markets uh, around the world uh, in addition to that. So, you know, I think as China's institutional markets become uh, or start to evolve even further, uh, things like portfolio construction and international diversification are going to become really important themes to the onshore investor. Uh, Kevin, would you agree with that assessment? Do you see it in any of the southbound flows? Yeah, certainly. Um, look, I, I'd just like to concur. I think there is a huge, huge um, increasing demand for overseas securities from from the from the from the mainland. Um, <clears throat> previous life of mine, I used to be um, seeing uh, as a broker, seeing huge amounts of um, of. Uh, east to west flow from um let's say offshore chinese banks in hong kong um servicing let's say high net worth individuals and whatnot um that that flow is incredible and I, I doubt very much that it's got any smaller um the the other thing that we do see clearly when the renminbi um, strengthens is that massive increase in the in the southbound volume and I suppose the, the mind probably imagines that it's buying um, Tencent and Alibaba and what's well, not Alibaba yet, not, not Connect eligible, but um, Xiaomi and Meituan, etc. Um, but we do see an increasing amount going into uh, to more international names like AIA, for example. Um, 
it's not inconceivable, I suppose, also that uh, another way of, um, of coming into and accessing international names um, via Hong Kong would be um, looking at structures like Yum China, for example, that would, uh, would carve out its, uh, its Chinese enterprise and list that here in Hong Kong. Um, and I, I don't think it's inconceivable to think that there'd be more of those type of structures coming. Uh, IMAX was probably the first of that some years ago already. Um, and then again, it's not inconceivable to imagine that um, you know that would be made available to the the, the greater China uh, uh, financial ecosystem. Um, perhaps we should talk about some of the sectors that might take advantage of um, financial flows either way. Uh, we've had a question from the audience about sports and TMT investments from China, especially in large club deals where PE fun, pun, funds can participate. Um, in particular in the context of China's focus on the World Cup. Um, do, do, do you see uh, that sort of sports and TNT sector being one of the, the growth areas for China? So, question for, for me, sorry. Or... Uh, so, sorry, um, if, if, if you'd like, sure. Um, otherwise, um, why don't I throw that over to, to um, uh, uh, Jai Chenxi. Oh, Patrick, please, if you're... Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, the, the Chinese uh, individual as well as institutional investor is as diverse as and varied as, as we see in the U.S., U.K., etc. Uh, the uh, interest in some thematics are, are going to be very high. Uh, I, I can't speak specifically of, of the material information I have regarding these the sports events, uh, but the interest in, um, in thematic areas such as that are, are going to be very high. Um, we see uh, a lot of interest in investment flows that participate through our company. Um, into the electric vehicle market. Uh, global electric vehicles is very important. Um, I think um, we also see different themes emerging among consumers, uh, consumer pet health, both overseas and in China. Um, Chinese are increasingly looking at things that are of interest to them, uh, that they see evolving as a market in their own, in their own country, and then they're applying it to some of their investment uh, strategies, both retail, but especially institutional, as they, as they invest overseas. Um, we haven't talked a great deal about the US, um, and uh, partly that presumably reflects the uh, election result we've just had. But um, we have had this sort of interesting period in which the kind of financial reforms that China has made have not been of great interest to the US administration. So we've had a four or five year period in which uh, reforms that might have impressed a previous administration don't seem to have been particularly impressive to uh, the Trump administration and Robert Lighthizer in particular. Um, my, my question is, you know, if, uh, as uh, seems certain now, we have an incoming Biden administration, um, will we revert back to a situation in which America is pushing hard uh, for financial opening up and sees that as a, a major concession from China um, that it can then use to uh, quell constituencies demanding even greater change? Um, will we see a sort of return to the um, Obama-Biden era um, in the negotiations with China. Um, uh, Eric, why don't you uh, have a go at that one? Sure, Simon. Um, I, look, I'm a little bit hesitant to say that we would go back strictly to, to the regime that we saw under uh, Obama and, and Biden. And, and the reason I say that is I suppose just a bit of caution about the fact that, you know, one topic that seemed to gather, you know, support across both sides of the aisle in the United States was, was taking a tougher line on negotiations with China and expecting more uh, in return from China. And it's not just the opening up of financial markets, the financial sector, but a number of the topics that uh, uh, the Trump administration focused on. Now, I think we will see uh, perhaps a more predictable or a more constructive approach to the whole uh, suite of, of negotiating topics. But I don't necessarily think we'll go back to uh, what we saw under, under Obama and, and Biden uh, in terms of Biden's uh, first time in office. Uh, Patrick, what do, what do you make of um, the potential for a Biden administration in its relations with China? 
Uh, I think a couple of things. I, I think that the approach is going to be more traditional. It'll be multilateral. There will be opportunities for China to present itself by saying, look, we're doing all of these types of things across different sectors. It will not come down to just whether it's agricultural purchases or not. It's going to be financial. It's going to be agricultural. It's going to be about intellectual property. Um, so I, I think... Um, um, there will be a, a better opportunity for China to show itself as a negotiator. But on the other hand, things have materially changed uh, and, I, and I can't revert. Uh, there is a, um, there is a, a, we are in a new world of concerns about IT security, um, not just intellectual property, but truly privacy and, and issues that we're now seeing crop up, not just to, as it relates to China, it relates to EU and Amazon, it relates to um, US companies operating in the US, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, media companies and the internet companies companies. Um, so um, it, it's not going to be the, the old way. There will be, uh, China is a strategic competitor, and there will be um, negotiations that will, that will treat China as such. Uh, Jai Chen Shi, I'd be keen to get your perspective on, on what you expect from a Biden administration. Okay, uh, but ac actually, as to the Chinese people, the local Chinese people, uh, it's difficult for us to to decide which one will be get elected and uh, and elected and uh, about their policy. But as to our Chinese people, I would like to say, if the election is con con is finished, that will be a good a good thing. It will be positive because more stability will anticipated post the U.S. election. So. As you, as all of the uh, uh, friends have mentioned about the opening and financial industry of China, so I would like to add some information to to you all. So, uh, firstly, I would like to share is that the Chinese government decided to open the financial sector of China. It's quite different. It's quite different between um, this period and the five years before. So, I have some data can share with you. Uh, since two years passed. Since the two, uh, 2019, uh, we can we can see the list. We have uh, have uh, five new foreign controlled security company, two foreign controlled fund management company, and 20 private security investment fund managers and international rating agencies such as Sanpool or Fitch have entered the Chinese market. And as as we know, the CSRC and the CBRC are also get more approval on the process to more US company or more European company, et cetera. So I think um, China is also on the changing period. They're trying to reopen their market, especially in the financial industry. So it's a little different, I think. So um, I truly hope that all of the financial industry investor pay more attention to this reopening period and opportunity. Kevin, we've seen a number of these um, homecoming listings, these you know, Chinese firms listed in the US doing follow-on listings in Hong Kong uh, or companies that might previously have decided to list in the US listing in, listing in Hong Kong instead. Um, has the trade war, has US tensions been good for HKEX? Um, it's hard to comment on that. Um, look, I think um, the... The tensions clearly saw um, a consideration from a number of Chinese companies to to come back to Hong Kong, if you will. Um, I think the catalyst for that was actually the restating of our um, of our listing rules um, to allow for weighted voting rights. If you if you can recall all the way back, I'm not sure how long you've been in Hong Kong. Um, Alibaba himself initially wanted to come to Hong Kong, but we just didn't have the regime to accommodate it. Um, and off to America it went. Um, it's only since we've done that we've been able to welcome these companies back. So is it down to the fact that we reformed the, uh, the, the, the listing rules? I, I tend to think it's a lot more to do with that. Um, was it catalyzed by um, certain trade tensions? Probably. Um, will it continue in the future? Um, we certainly have a, a very healthy and robust pipeline, as I've mentioned. Um, it's uh, it's also um, you know it's um, it remains to be seen I think how that how that tension uh, will will either dissipate or uh, 
or, or plateau. Um, Eric, it's been mentioned, I think perhaps you mentioned it also, that um, uh, America will potentially pursue a more multilateral approach in its dealings with China. Um, could that end up being more difficult for China to deal with, even if it's more predictable? Uh, th look, there's two very different uh, interpretations of uh, that topic. Uh, the first of which is that if the US is looking to positively reset its trading relationships with its historical allies and trading partners, then you have a more unified front. Uh, and there is uh, a view out there that says that that would make life uh, much more difficult for China because they're now facing uh, a collective rather than uh, a disparate one. Um, I think on the more constructive side, um, one of the really fascinating economic aspects of the current crisis is that actually emerging market exports have recovered to their pre-COVID levels uh, in two quarters, right? It's been a very quick recovery for emerging markets, especially in Asia. And a lot of that has to do with intra-regional trade. And so I think to the extent that, that the Biden administration wants to pursue a more constructive and multilateral approach to global trade, that's going to be a net positive for, for the region in Asia generally. And China is, is a massive uh, part of that, of that growth engine. So I lean in the direction that it's, it's a net positive, but, but there will be some skepticism about that. Um, Jen Chen-Chi, uh, Jai Chen-Chi, um, one of the unique aspects of China's rise is that it has legitimate aspirations for its currency to become uh, widely used internationally. Uh, and also, you know, the threat of US sanctions has also motivated China uh, to look to decouple from the dollar. Um, what do you think are the prospects for internationalization of the RMB um, now that trade tensions seem to be uh, settling? Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think as to the Chinese government, um, during the past four years, it's quite tension for the Chinese government to, um, how to say, to balance the tension between the U.S. and the China. So, um, and the Chinese government does put more emphasis on the safety of the financial industry and technology industry. Um, I, I cannot, I'm not sure whether the Chinese government will decrease the U.S.D. Um, reserve or other use, but Chinese government does have the uh, does have the decision to make RMB more internationalization. So that's also the reason why the Chinese government decided to welcome more in institutional uh, investors to go into China to buy the local equity market and the bond market, and, um, stimulate more issuer to go to uh, Hong Kong Exchange to issue bond or to issue or to get listed. So, so, so to conclude, to sum up is that um, Chinese government is, is trying to, to learn how to balance the RMB internationalization and how to reserve, use the ECO as a reserve currency. So uh, Chinese government is to make a balance and begin to learn, I think. Uh, thank you. Um, we've come to the end of our session. I want to thank you all very much for your contributions and your thoughts. Um, it is a new dynamic, I think, between China and the US, even if some of the dramatist personae, uh, Mr. Biden in particular, are quite old. Uh, thank you very much for your, for your conversation.